Please enter your destination number. For a generation of today's youths raised on smartphones, multi-megabit downloads, and digital home phones before them, the idea that the phone system was once primitive enough that it could be manipulated with a plastic toy whistle is at once both strange and tantalizing. But that's exactly what happened back in the 1970s, when natural curiosity about evolving phone networks birthed the generation of inquisitive phone freaks who spent considerable time and energy poking and prodding the phone network to see what was going on behind that rotary handset. A phone freak is someone who is obsessively interested in learning about or playing with or exploring the telephone network. Today, you think of them as the predecessor to network hackers. That was Phil Lapsley, author of the book Exploding the Phone, the untold story of the teenagers and outlaws who hacked Ma Bell. The technology behind the evolving telephone network was actually a result of efforts to automate it. Before then, human operators were in charge of routing calls, but starting in the 1940s, significant advancements were made, which, Lapsley told us, is what gave some users the power to directly control the phone system. The phone company was building this astonishing system, which was an interconnection of people, customers, telephone equipment, this weird combination, a kind of a magical combination of humans as customers, telephone switching equipment as machines, and then more humans, typically operators, and then technicians and engineers designing and making this machine all work. By the 60s and 70s, you would pick up your phone and you didn't know it, but you were connected to the largest machine in the world. In the early 1960s, Joe Ingressia, who later went by the name Joy Bubbles, was a blind genius who developed a love for the telephone at an early age. Gifted with perfect pitch, he realized that if he whistled the exact tone of 2600 hertz, which corresponds to the seventh octave E on a piano keyboard, into the telephone receiver, he could make free phone calls and explore the inner workings of the telephone network, which was based on a system of tones. If you wanted to dial, for example, the number 212, it might sound something like, so two bips and then one and then two. And he found that he could, by the time he went away to college, he could whistle free calls in the system. And you got to remember, this is back in the day when phone calls were really expensive. So being able to whistle a free call was really a pretty neat parlor trick. In the early 70s, the freaking community began circulating plans that explained how to build a blue box, a device that transmitted audio tones of certain frequencies that were used by then-monopolist carrier AT&T to route calls around the phone network. Steve Wozniak and his friend Steve Jobs made hacking history in the early 70s before co-founding Apple. The Woz built the first digital blue box used by phone freaks. What a trip that was. I had tricks in there that I never even equaled in my Apple designs, believe it or not. Watching Woz give demos of the illegal product in the Berkeley dorms where Woz was a student, Jobs had the idea that they should be selling the blue boxes for $150 each. The duo never got in trouble for their phone hacking exploits. I have never really hacked. We're doing stuff for fun, really. Woz recalls the blue box as a teaching moment for Jobs. That was like the first time he found that you can make money if you have a product. In a 1994 interview with the Santa Clara Valley Historical Association, Steve Jobs looked back on the blue box experience. I actually figured out how to build one. We built the best one in the world. It was the first digital blue box in the world. But it was the magic of the fact that two teenagers could build this box for $100 worth of parts and control hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure in the entire telephone network in the whole world from Los Altos and Cupertino, California. If we hadn't have made blue boxes, there would have been no Apple. Phone freaking undeniably paved the way for the current hacker community and the cyber threats we face today. The correlation between manipulating technology and organized crime has continued through the decades and, according to Lapsley, it isn't going to stop anytime soon. Whenever you have some sort of new technology, whether it's AI, whether it's the internet, whether it's the telephone back in the 1960s, there's always going to be people who are going to play around with it. There are going to be people who are going to abuse it and do illegal things with it. Phone freaking was all about technological curiosity. That is the thing that drives people, it drives hackers, whether you're talking about a network hacker or a phone freak, it's kind of same, same, and it's all ultimately, I think, driven by curiosity.